When people word make move mouth sound, hi, I'm Zinniop. Phonology, the study of the sounds that occur in a language, is uncomfortably complicated, but our scientists have more or less created a semi-comprehensive list of all possible sounds, the IPA. Now, I'm not a huge fan of it, but that's another video. In this video, I'm here to point out that that list is specific to humans because it's tailored to the human mouth. Other animals have mouths. In fact, the entire clade Nephrozoa has one. I can't hope to cover all of them, but I can get some interesting representatives. So let's see the phonologies possible in the animal kingdom. Unfortunately, we have to start with humans. I know, I'm just as disappointed as you are, but we need a jumping off point. So every sound can be described by three things. How it happens, where it happens, and voicing. There are two main ways for it to happen, giving the airflow difficulty and letting it flow as normal. This divides further into stopping the air, letting it through, and stopping the air, but then slowly letting it through. The other group includes gently shaping it, redirecting it out the nose, then trying to stop it but failing, and then doing that repeatedly. That last one can only happen if the articulators are flappy enough, so it's restricted to a few places of articulation. Here's your mouth. Yes, your tongue really is that big. The where is described by which two parts of the mouth come together. The top lip and the bottom lip, the top teeth and the bottom lip, the top teeth and the front tongue, the alveolar ridge and the front tongue, just behind that and the front tongue, hard palate and front tongue, hard palate and back tongue, soft palate and back tongue, that pink fleshy thing that dangles at the back of the throat, and very back tongue, the front and back of the throat, and the folds of the glottis. Those last two are different because the pharynx doesn't have articulators, it's more like a tube of flesh that can vaguely constrict. The glottis does have articulators, but those come from the sides rather from the top and bottom. It's also different for more reasons, which I'll get to. A similar thing is the alveolar lateral place of articulation. The sides of the tongue press against the molars to produce sounds like la or hya. The palatal and velar also have lateral, but these are rare. And then there are two even rarer places of articulation, top and bottom teeth and top lip and front tongue. Lingual labial also has its own lateral. Is that it? No, it gets way, way worse. Especially on the alveolar ridge, the exact shape and position of the tongue can have magnified effect, leading to a whole mess of symbols, but let's not worry about that right now. Co-articulation is another important thing, and it's complicated, so try to keep up. It's when you say two sounds at the same time. That leaves voicing. Voicing is complicated but intuitive. If you say fa and va when holding your throat, you should feel a vibration. That vibration is actually a trill occurring at the glottal place of articulation. I told you it was weird. Now, the glottis is so flappy that it doesn't really affect other places, so we treat it like its own thing, and those three descriptions can be used to describe any sound that occurs, in humans at least. So overall, a major point of variance is going to be in the deep throat. Humans have a tall pharynx big enough for the pharyngeal place of articulations. Chimpanzees lack that. Their throat is compressed. This is called a descended larynx in humans, and it's one of the keys to human speech. Without the room to breathe, chimpanzees wouldn't have access to the delicate register distinctions humans can make. Humans can make noticeable differences depending on how much they breathe out. Chimps might be reduced to a single modal voice, and this modal voice would sound raspy, and it would be difficult for them to talk for extended periods of time. However, they do have a massively extended epiglottis, this flap of skin that keeps the air hole and food hole separate. This might partially make up for the shrunken pharynx, at least in terms of the place of articulation. That leaves the palate. Humans have a distinct alveolar ridge, while chimpanzees have a flatter mouth. This might eliminate the delicate distinction between alveolar and postalveolar, but this distinction is typically because of weird tongue shapes, not the actual point of contact. And with chimpanzees having a flatter and more dexterous tongue than humans, I think they can more than make up for it. But you're not here for monkeys. Let's do something more complicated. This is how a chimpanzee would talk. So, bear with me, the teeth present a unique challenge. Humans have a broad plate of teeth which can be used like an airtight articulator to produce sounds like F and V. A bear's spiky teeth would allow too much air through. That probably ruins dental and labiodental obstruents, but the teeth are not only important for those two, sibilants like S require the airflow to strike the teeth to produce their distinctive sound. Without that, bears would also lack some of the variety possible by changing the tongue shape at the alveolar ridge. That, coupled with the complete lack of said alveolar ridge, probably eliminates the post-alveolar place of articulation entirely. This is how a bear would talk. 
So the birds don't have a larynx. Okay, that's misleading. Birds do have a larynx, but they don't have vocal folds. That comes from the syrinx, which is located way further down, back at the entrance to the lungs. That means the glottal isn't weird anymore, it's just another place of articulation. Although without the folds, it just kind of turns into another pharynx. Although the epiglottis is gone, so it kind of subsumes it. Plus, they have the arytenoid cartilages, the tissues that hold the vocal cords taut or loose when producing vocal fry, and without folds, these might become articulators. The syrinx can't articulate, because it doesn't close like the glottis would, but we'd still probably describe h and the vowels as syringeal. However, that does mean that it can work just fine when inhaling. Unlike other mammals, a syrinx is way better than a human. While humans can only use 2% of their breath to produce sounds, birds can use nearly 100. They might have access to more extreme registers and certainly more tones. A syrinx is made up of three sets of vibrating rings containing however many discrete rings, allowing for delicate changes in pitch, and since part of it is below the split of the trachea, there can be a difference between the left and right sides. Although the problem with tones is not how many we can produce, but how many we can recognize. They do lose some phonology potential, however. Birds have no lips, killing the bilabial, labiodental, and lingual labial. It's not impossible that they could still use the beak to labialize, but mammalian lips are the way to form an airtight seal. They also have no teeth, killing the dental, and no secondary palate. This not only kills velar, but it makes nasalization trickier. You see, normally airflow coming up from the larynx is forced into the mouth by the soft palate closing against the top of the mouth. For nasals, it's lowered to encourage airflow through the nose. Birds don't have that luxury, so all sounds are compulsorily nasalized. In fact, any attempt at a plosive would only result in a nasal. It's worse than it looks, because birds also have a koana, which is a giant hole in the hard palate. This nasalization becomes apparent if you listen to an actual bird. But I suppose all of that's a moot point, since birds are AI-powered drones created by the Jewish elite. This is how I learn one now. My example is that the Komodo dragon does not have mammalian teeth. That probably, again, ruins the post-alveolar, but the way the teeth are curled up also presents problems for the dental place of articulation, which probably ends up with the alveolar. The labiodental, likewise, is probably impossible, but that's not the least of our problems. The Komodo dragon, like most lizards, completely lacks a soft palate and possesses not one, but two koan... I is the plural. On the bright side, this does allow for lateral nasals, but that's not the least of our problems. You see, all lizards, except geckos and snakes, have no vocal folds, and snakes only have one, which isn't very helpful. That means they can't make voiced sounds. This is a big problem. English, like all human languages, can be thought of as a long stream of voicing broken up by the occasional voiceless consonant. Without voicing, vowels can't exist. Well, it's not that simple. For one thing, whisper exists. But devoiced vowels can't make as many distinctions. Just look at English. There are eight monophthong vowels in my accent of English and one voiceless vowel, and that disparity can grow. Sure, according to some idiot YouTuber, Proto-Indo-European had four voice to three voiceless, but, well, see how that turned out for them. So, is there any way to emulate voicing without voicing? Well, Whistled languages do exist, and we always pog very hard because of how cool they are. Although we like to describe them similarly to the consonants, a vowel is essentially the ratio of two formant frequencies. If you can control the pitch, you can produce vowels. Now, with whistling, you are tied to a single pitch, so you are limited to only a front-back distinction, and it overlaps with tone. But there are languages with worse, so that leaves one question. Do lizards have the capability of whistling? Well, the prevailing answer seems to be that fluid dynamics is really, 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 really complicated. But this fellow native to Sri Lanka is called the Whistling Lizard, so at least one can. <laughs> Frogs, fortunately, do have vocal cords. There's no secondary palate, again, and they have internal nares, but these are reduced. However, that's not really relevant, because frogs don't speak using their mouths, so that pouch you'll see at the bottom of a bullfrog is not actually part of the mouth, it's attached to the mouth the same way the sinuses are, but really it's a different place. Airflow has to go directly into the pouch for an interesting reason. In humans, we have two respiratory states, actively inhaling and passively exhaling. Frogs don't have that, their lungs can only be neutral. That means the only way to get air in and out is by using the mouth to pump it in and out. And obviously the mouth and nose have to be closed to generate pressure. That means, paradoxically, frogs can't breathe out while their mouth is open. So any articulator that's going to have an effect on the phonology has to occur not before the end of the mouth, but before the entry to the vocal sac, which unfortunately is kind of right there once you leave the larynx. That means pretty much the only place of articulation is pharyngeal. But what if you can make sounds without breathing out? 
In English, all sounds are pulmonic egressive, or lungs out. Harkening back to the place of articulation, you can think of it as one of two places. The places where air is squeezed, generating pressure outwards. Lungs out. Like I said, lungs in is not as common because vocal cords don't vibrate that way, so it can potentially cause damage. Glottis out is called ejectives. The air is squeezed between the articulator and the closed vocal cords. Since the glottis thrusting upwards is weaker than the unmatched power of the lungs, this one is restricted to obstruents. Glottis in is called implosives, and as the name suggests, the glottis pumping downwards is so weak it's restricted to plosives. Tongue in, or click, is when a pocket of air is trapped between the back of the tongue and the front. The middle of the tongue suddenly drops, decrease in pressure, click sound. There's not enough air trapped in there for tongue out. Now, while a human tongue looks like this, a frog's looks like this, and they also have no secondary palate, so they might have some trouble with clicks, but I think frogs could handle ejectives just fine. <laughs> So, if you're a fan of etymology nerd, which let's not kid ourselves you are, you might have seen the videos trying to make a dolphin con like. It mimics the sound well enough, but the way dolphins really make sound is weird and confusing. So, if you didn't like the lack of a secondary palate, then get ready, because in dolphins, the secondary palate extends all the way down to the epiglottis. The nose, which is the blowhole, is for breathing, while the mouth is only for eating. This produces some interesting parallels if we swap nasal and oral, and then erase nasal. We can compare the human mouth to the dolphin nose. That being the case, a dolphin does lack a larynx, but they have the next best thing. The monkey lips, or phonic lips if you want to be boring, or dorsal bursi if you want to be really boring. They have two on one side, one on the other. They can produce trills or plosives, but these are the only places of articulation they have access to. And technically the clicks aren't plosives, but percusses. This is when the two smack together and ignore the airflow. This is for a similar reason to frogs, although dolphins are mammals so they can breathe out, they just don't like to because they live underwater. So instead of opening the nose to talk, they just sort of let it vibrate in their head. Now, dolphins get better acoustics because they have a melon in their head, but that's the idea. <laughs> So, with fish, it's so jover, right? They don't even have lungs to breathe out of. Well, they don't have lungs, but they have the precursor, a swim bladder. Now, they have no epiglottis dividing the two, no voice box, no nothing. The mouth is purely for digestion. The bladder is just a balloon with a tube attached on as an afterthought that can seal itself off by constricting. And yet. There's a reason I chose trout, not just for the memes. They belong to the family Sciinidae, called the drummers. As the name suggests, muscles surrounding the swim bladder can beat against it, causing it to vibrate like a drum. That vibration produces a sound that's close enough to voicing for my purposes. Now, again, trout can't breathe out with the mouth open, and they also live underwater, so that kills the bilabial and labiodental places of articulation. And they wouldn't breathe out even if they could, because the drum muscles don't have anything to do with exhaling, and therefore can't produce a continuous period of voicing. Well, they could if you just keep thumping, but they're not designed to. But let's ignore all of that now and focus on the mouth of the trout. What's it shaped like? Well, as you might know, mammals have three ear bones and one jawbone, while reptiles have three jawbones and one ear bone. A fish has four jawbones, but crucially, not for the same jaw. It's pretty complicated, and fish even have some bones that were just lost in tetrapods, but basically fish have one jaw and a bunch of branchial arches that hold the gills open, and one at the very back that doesn't have a gill to correspond to has grown an extra pair of teeth. That would allow for the lovely pharyngeodental place of articulation. But back to the gill arches, they have gill rakers, these giant spiky things that catch any fish they swallow before they can swim out the gills. These, along with some weird motion from the gills, might allow for a pharyngeal lateral place of articulation without using the tongue. They have no secondary palate, but the nose doesn't enter into the problem because the primary palate attaches the nose directly to the brain. The distance is probably big enough to retain the palatal velar distinction, but with no uvula comes no uvular. The alveolar ridge is so simplified, I would even cut out the retroflex alveolar distinction. Without a glottis, a trout cannot produce ejectives, but it would probably still be able to produce clicks. Unless its tongue has been eaten by a tongue-eating louse, then it probably couldn't do any of that. And that's where I'll have to end this video today. If you're interested to see how I manage when we remove the swim bladder entirely, uh, stay tuned, I guess. I'm already committed to making it, so you don't have to like this or subscribe if you don't want to.